authenticity. Every fiction writer strives for it, but when the story calls for intimate knowledge of the complexities of geopolitics, insight into covert operations, and the tradecraft of the world's intelligence agencies, authenticity often proves elusive. Not for Joel C. Rosenberg. As a political consultant and author, Rosenberg has advised people ranging from Steve Forbes to Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, and met with many of the Arab world's most influential leaders, including King Abdul II of Jordan and the Saudi Crown Prince. And if that was not enough, he calls Secretary of State Mike Pompeo a friend. His contacts and experiences not only lend a gritty realism to his work, but have led to Rosenberg being called a modern-day Nostradamus for his novel's tendency to predict major world events. His debut novel, The Last Jihad, was written nine months prior to the 9-11 attacks. Featured was a kamikaze-style attack on an American city leading to a war in Iraq. The novel was a New York Times bestseller and kicked off a career that has spanned 14 novels and five nonfiction titles. His latest Marcus Riker novel, The Jerusalem Assassin, hit bookstands in March and once again demonstrated Rosenberg's ability to anticipate world events. The novel Brad Thor calls a taut, brilliant home run, features an Israeli peace treaty with a Mideast power, and dark forces determined to stop it. In other words, it's right in Joel Rosenberg's wheelhouse. Hi, this is Joel Rosenberg, author of The Jerusalem Assassin. You're watching the crew reviews, and you ought to be. We would love to introduce Mr. Joel Rosenberg to the Crew Reviews podcast. How are you, good sir? I'm doing well. Great to be with you guys. Yeah, Enjoy. thank you. Well, let's get right to it, sir. Do it. I'm the uh, host for today's show, and I'm going to ask uh, my first question. Um, with 15 thrillers, not to mention a handful of nonfiction titles to your name, we have a lot of ground to cover today. Uh, but I want to get started at the beginning. Your first novel, The Last Jihad, was written nine months before September uh, 11th attacks. And it spent 11 weeks in the New York Times bestseller list and reached number seven. Were there specific warning signs in your inner circles prompting the storyline before the attack actually happened? Well, I uh, should start by saying that I'm a failed political consultant. I mean, that was my, <laughs> my professional pedigree before writing fiction, which everyone thought I was writing fiction when I was working for these politicians. But uh, one of the people I had worked with was the Prime Minister of Israel. Uh, at that point, he was the former Prime Minister of Israel, Benjamin Netanyahu. And I was on his comeback campaign team in the fall of 2000. Okay. Now, he did come back nine years after I worked <laughs> for him. So mm. I played no role whatsoever. In fact, it was the last politician that I worked for and helped lose. And uh, <laughs> I helped support two presidential campaigns and about $70 million of his daughter's inheritance money. And so anyway, there's a whole list of them. But the point is, um, having worked for them all, I I'd, I'd, I'd learned a lot of things. And one of them was working for an Israeli prime minister. Um, didn't agree with him on everything, but I agreed with him on a lot. And one of his, one of Netanyahu's main concern, what he talked about often, in the 1990s uh, was the threat that radical Islamism, political, violent Islam, uh, was coming to the shores of the United States, just like it kept attacking Israel, if American leaders were not, um, were not focused on that threat and, and weren't uh, fully engaged in dealing with it. So after he uh, was sort of checkmated from running at that particular time, and, and I ended my, uh, my role with him, I began thinking about, you know, I maybe, I, maybe I should get out of politics and you know, start <laughs> making things up for a living. And um, I began thinking, all right, well, I would need a, I would need a story. I would need a, a what-if scenario to write my first political thriller. And I remember uh, one of his concerns. He'd written about it. He'd spoken about it. He testified before Congress about it. All that to say was, what if radical Islamist ter terrorists were to try to, um, you know, attack uh, the World Trade Center again or attack inside the United States, even with chemical, biological, or nuclear weapons? Now, if I'd really taken him to, 
exactly the way he said it, I probably would have had that kamikaze attack actually be against the World Trade Centers. He'd mm -hmm. written that in a book um, in, back in the 1990s. Um, I, I'm actually glad that I didn't think of that or, or, or build that into the story, because that would have been just too weird. Yeah. Um, scary um so but uh, yeah but i thought what would be a dramatic way to open this novel and i wanted it to be a novel that dealt with threats that both americans and israelis face together uh and the idea of somebody hijacking a jet plane and flying it into an american city uh seemed like a very compelling opening for a political thriller it also seemed like something that was plausible right we hadn't really seen kamikaze attacks uh, since World War II, um, really with the Imperial Japanese, but within the world of radical Islamism, um, suicide bombers were a thing. So um, anyway, that, that was the sort of the genesis of that novel. And as it happened, since I had, you know, helped him not go anywhere politically <laughs> in the fall of 2000, by January of 01, I had time on my hands. <laughs> and so I sat down and thought, maybe I'll write the first few chapters of my first ever political thriller. And that became The Last Jihad. Yeah. That's well, awesome. speaking of the timing of it, with the attacks right around that, I mean, did that really intensify the spotlight on your very first novel? I mean, did that kind of thrust you out there a little bit more, you think? Well, the novel wasn't out yet. I was, I was actually finishing the novel. True, 2002, uh, right. Uh, in Washington, D.C., in the townhouse where my wife and kids and I were living at the time, about 15 minutes away from Washington Dulles Airport, where at that moment, that morning, I wasn't, you know, I didn't have radio on, I didn't have TV on. I was just trying to finish this novel because it wasn't my full-time job. I didn't have a book contract. I did not have an agent. And I didn't have, you know, the wherewithal just to, take forever and try, you know, try my hand at writing a political thriller. So right. I had, there was an agent in New York that had shown interest in the first three chapters, the kamikaze chapters, and said, look, get, listen, get this thing done as fast as possible. Mm. And uh, if it's good, if it holds up, we'll represent you. I'm like, great. So I sort of moved my various clients around and was focused. So that morning of 9-11, the book was not out. I was finishing it. And actually, what's interesting is that Kamikaze attack was the beginning, but it leads my American president, fictionally, not only to launch a, a war against these radical Islamist cells, but against Saddam Hussein, trying yeah. to remove him from power. Yeah. That was what was particularly weird because none of that was really in the air. There'd been talk about, you know, Saddam's a threat and we should do something about it at some point, but uh, it wasn't. It wasn't a dominant theme in the Bush administration, which was just underway, right? They'd only right. taken off in January. Uh, so there really wasn't much talk about that, but I thought that's plausible. If an attack like that ha happened and there was a president like Bush, maybe. Um, so, that's, so that was weird. So it wasn't really until the book was released in the fall of 2002, Right. November, actually, just just days before Thanksgiving, about the worst time to release a novel. <laughs> <laughs> a month out from Christmas, you, but that's as fast as they could get it out, and yeah. that's when people are like, okay, that's weird. And yeah, that's when it's enormous interest. Yeah, because yeah, then sure. we go into Iraq. It was crazy. Um, Joel, yeah, the, I, the, I don't the, think the, it's overstating to say. Happen, but the but the debate over should we go to war in Iraq, and again, I hope you're. Listeners uh, will and viewers will set aside their own political views of whether we should or shouldn't have. Just imagine yourself the first time you've ever written a novel and imagine it's January of 21 and you're thinking, you know, what if, I don't know, what if somebody attacked Pearl Harbor? Or maybe not Pearl Harbor, maybe Midway, I don't know, but what if it was the Japanese and what if that set into motion a war in which the United States dropped two atomic bombs? Just that would be an interesting <laughs> novel, wouldn't it? Then December 7th, 1941 happens, the day that lives in infamy, and you know, your details aren't exactly right because you're not trying to prophesy it. You're just trying to imagine what if, which is, I think, right. the base of every good political thriller. But whether you think the decision to go to war in Iraq was right or wrong, it certainly looked very lucky, very prescient, very something. Right. Um, 
that this oh, novel yeah. was releasing right when the whole country, the whole world was debating, should we, shouldn't we? Right, right. I don't think it's overstating to say uh, you have friendships and, and prof professional relationships with some of the most powerful and knowledgeable people in the world. How have those relationships impacted you as a, as a storyteller? Well, it's interesting uh, because at the time when I got started, yes, I obviously had a relationship with Netanyahu. To be honest, uh, I, haven't, I haven't had a personal meeting with Netanyahu in 10 years. Hmm. So it's not like um, you know, that's a relationship that has remained. Am, am I close to some of his senior staff and advisors and team? Yeah, but I, like I said, I, I, I'm not actually close to Netanyahu. At the time, though, I had just worked for him. I didn't know his inner circle. And I was able to draw from them insights into, all right, let's just imagine this and, and, and play it out. Um, and, you know, and I had known some other leaders, but what has happened since over the years is with the success of the books, um, more and more interesting people have read it. I'm glad that anybody would read my novels. I mean, to be honest, you know, I tell young aspiring authors, don't, don't aspire to be in the New York Times bestseller list. I mean, that's a good goal, but 99.9% .9 of people don't make it. So just your goal should be that your mother should be able to find the book at a bookstore within a hundred miles of her house. That, that's your goal. They'll open up and go, wow, cool. my son really did it or my daughter really did it. Yeah. Um, so, but yes, over time uh, with, you know, 5 million sold and the rest, some very interesting people have read it and maybe better for me than they read it was they didn't hate it. And they reached out and said, let's have coffee or let's have lunch. And that has set into motion all kinds of interesting relationships that I didn't actually have uh, at the beginning, many of whom have become friends and, and some of whom have become sources. <laughs> and that has been pretty cool. Yeah. Joel, do you ever find, do you ever find those relationships a hindrance because you can't use some of the material that you've talked about, like with people with like sex state uh, Pompeo? Um, I haven't found them a hindrance yet. <laughs> um, I think that if, if there's a hindrance, it may be an instinct or, or caution to self edit or self censor. Like, would I try to kill that character off if I already know them? Like, okay. So for mm -hmm. example, um, so I was supposed to do a book event in the opening of my latest novels, uh, book tour, the Jerusalem assassin in, in March with secretary Pompeo. Um, now the COVID, you know, crisis uh, caused that to be canceled and we rescheduled and we did it in the, uh, you know, just this past summer out in Iowa. But it was interesting because I met with him. And I said, you know, I'm happy to do this event with you, but I just want to assure you, uh, Mr. Secretary, that the Secretary of State is not assassinated like a lot of other characters are in the gruesome assassin. I, it would be weird, I think, yeah. to do an event with him if sorry. I was like, and by the way, you don't make it. Like that, sorry. That would be weird. Now, I hadn't anticipated even somebody inviting us both to an event, but I was kind of glad that I hadn't knocked him off. Um, you know, <laughs> um, but, uh, but I actually got to know him because he's a reader of the, of the novel. Back when he was on the Intelligence Committee, yeah. in the house and somebody invited me over for coffee uh with him and who knew right that the guy would become a cia director a secretary of state you know shake hands with the uh with the dear leader of north korea i mean right. he's a good source i mean I, I you know i can't say that everything that's interesting in my books comes from him right, right. but I, I wouldn't deny it either <laughs> you know why why would you <laughs> okay so Here's a quote I know means something to you. Write where you live in your head. Can you explain the relevance of that and why it resonated so strongly with you? Sure. Uh, so a lot of authors talk to young people and they say, write what you know. That, I, I mean, to a degree that's true, but it, it wasn't really true for me. I've never killed anyone. And I <laughs> have never jumped out of a plane. Hey, I'm not, my kids have. I haven't. My, my, one of my sons is in special forces here in Israel. About two of sons have served in the military here. That wasn't something I've done, right? And so there's a lot, uh, you know, I'm not as wealthy as some of my characters in the book. I'm not as you know, clever. You know, give me a year to make something up. I might be able to do it. But if it's on the spot, look, come on, I, I, that's just not my skill set. So 
Um, so I, I tell young people, you know, write what, where you live in your head. Where, not, you know, sort of what do you imagine, either in terms of worst case scenarios or dreams that you have, or fantasies, or whatever it is, if you're living there in your head, that's a good indication that that's the type of place you want to spend time in that place, as that person, as that with those skill sets, whatever. And then, you know, Google's your best friend and you can do a lot of research and fill in the gaps. But um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I, you know, I'm a failed political consultant, but I don't write about failed consultants. I write about people who actually are advisors to world leaders, people who are world leaders, leaders and, um, and I make them a lot more interesting than me because otherwise, you know, nobody would read it, so. <laughs> well, kind of piggybacking on that though, as writers, we always talk about this with each other and people who are on the show. There generally is some segment of you that is in your protagonist, uh, for most of us, I think. You have a pretty diverse group of protagonists. Um, is there something of Joel in, in each of those gentlemen that you've written about? Yes, I'm, I'm sure that there are. Um, you know, actually, I had this conversation with Ryan Steck from uh, The Real Book Spot. Yeah, we know Ryan. A while back this year. And one of the things I noted was, or he noted, was, you know, unlike the really successful authors, Joel, uh, <laughs> you haven't stuck with one franchise character and, you know, built your entire career in that. Just curious why. And um, he was nice about it. But it is true, um, you know, if you, if you look at Daniel Silva, you look at Brad Thor, obviously uh, Clancy and, you know, so many of the other uh, uh, guys who did, you know, just did it so well. Um, uh, you know, the character alone, right? I mean, you just keep writing the, that character. And I haven't. Um, I'm not, I wouldn't say I regret it because I've enjoyed writing each series that they were. As, as they were, because there were stories I really wanted to tell. And I, honestly, I can't say that I anticipated a career in this. I thought, I might get a chance to write a novel or two. Let's take a whirl at that. I, I kept my, my consulting company there. I literally just, I'm shutting it down this year. I've been, oh, wow. I've been writing for almost 20 years and I'm, <laughs> you know. So, you, you're, so if you ask what's really in, the, in all the characters, they are worst case scenario thinkers. Okay, I'm Russian Jewish on my father's side. I'm Gentile on my mom's side. And we're actually evangelicals. But the Russian Jewish genetics on my father's side caused me to think very darkly about the world. Okay, and I think for good reason. We, you know, you know the, there. people don't try to, try to pick on the Jews. They try to annihilate us. That's the <laughs> term that's been used from, uh, you know, Haman in the book of Esther, let's annihilate all the Jewish people in the Persian Empire, right up to, you know, the Ayatollah Hamanai, right? So it, we come by that sense of pessimism, uh, honestly, right? I, I'm, yeah. I'm not a glass half full guy. I'm a, not only am I a glass half empty guy, I, I believe the, the, gra the glass is cracked and it's leaking. So <laughs> that's the way I see the world as, bad things are gonna happen. And if they don't happen today, they're gonna happen tomorrow. And, um, and so I think all of the characters, uh, if you look at you know, John Bennett right up through um, you know, the most recent uh, Marcus Riker, I think they, they, they see threats and they take them very seriously. And I think that people who are in the intelligence business are in geopolitical analysis have to be people who um, know how to channel that from being depressed and, and drunk, you know, or a drug addict, right? To, all right, I see bad things could happen. Let's analyze it and let's figure out how to stop it, how to counter it, how to challenge it, right? Uh, either before it happens or as it happens. So that I think that that sort of analysis and seeing around corners, seeing up over the horizon, I think, um, I think each of those characters that I have, um, have been able to do it. And that's maybe the only thing that's consistent. Uh, John Bennett was a Wall Street strategist and, I, and a, just mm -hmm. a, had a, made a fortune on Wall Street before he got pulled into politics, uh, working at the White House and then getting caught in the maelstrom of the Middle East. And, uh, you know, Marcus Riker in the new series, right? He's a, he's a Marine, served in combat. I didn't. 
serve as a Marine or anything else. Uh, you know, again, I'm, I was a film student in college and uh, I've been to Afghanistan, I've been to Iraq, but I didn't shoot anybody unless you count the camera. And um, he's a former Secret Service agent. Okay, I've been to the White House, I know Secret Service agents, but you know, so, um, so a lot of those characters are not me, but their ability to see threats ahead of most people, I think is probably the consistent, um, you know, the common denominator. Yeah. Well, and just so our viewers know that you are currently in Israel, uh, which is your primary residence, but obviously you you were born here in the United States. It, with that, you have a broader worldview than most. Um, and do you think that has some influence in your writing, being a dual citizen? Probably, yes. I mean, I think I've been writing about uh, the common threats that we face both as Americans as Israelis, and honestly, at, in the Muslim world, in the Arab world, um, is, you know, Saddam Hussein was killed more Arabs, killed more Muslims than he ever killed of Jews or Americans, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. right. Uh, Osama bin Laden has killed more Muslims mm. than he ever killed of Americans, and he obviously, he and his team killed a lot of Americans. Yeah. The Islamic State killed way more Muslims than they ever killed of Westerners. So we actually face a common threat. Um, and so when I started writing these novels, again, in the winter of 2001, I did not anticipate that one day uh, my wife and four sons and I would move to Israel, become dual US Israeli citizens and live in Jerusalem and, and have two sons serving in the army. So. Uh, that wasn't something I anticipated, but it's thematically, it's consistent with my life, both uh, being Jewish and as an evangelical and as, a, as an author. And these are the things that concern me, the things that worry me. What, what I think people thought I was crazy when we did move was like, do you even read your own books? <laughs> <laughs> I, I was going to say that. <laughs> like, are you insane? Like, do you know what's going to happen? I know you make it up, but it's sort of real, isn't it? Like, so... We moved in the summer of uh, 2014, okay? And there was a huge rocket war. There's like 4,200 rockets and missiles flying into Israel from the Gaza Strip, yeah. right? And I was on a radio station in Chicago, just one of the last interviews I did before we got on the plane and flew to Israel. And the host was like, are, are you insane? Like, I love your book. <laughs> You're mad. Like, what kind of crazy person would get his take his family, sell their house, and move to Israel during a freaking mm -hmm. rocket war? Yeah. Like, and, and I said, "Well, sir, you know, you live in Chicago, <laughs> right? Like, there are more mm -hmm. people that have died in Chicago this weekend than have died in the last several Israeli Arab wars combined. So, yeah. you know, who's the crazy one here? And yeah, that's true. Sort of laughed and got it, but." Both things are true. Mm -hmm. uh, he was yeah. he wasn't wrong, uh, but neither was I. Right. <laughs> and you could have picked like Tel Aviv, or, or you went to Jerusalem. <laughs> I, yeah. Well, at the time we were living uh, a little north of Tel Aviv, near the near the coast. Uh, it's only the last couple of years that we actually uh, moved up, as it were. Yeah. Uh, sure. Sure. Jerusalem, but uh, you know, interestingly enough, Jerusalem is one of the safest cities in the Middle East. And like, okay, that's not a big. Uh, standard, but I, you know, um, even I would say in the world, we we feel much more comfortable walking around the streets of Jerusalem uh, at night. Uh, we've got a 16 year old son; he's skateboarding all, all across the city at all the day, Mike, except when we're in quarantine. Uh, but um, it's much safer than than walking through Washington D.C. or 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 New York right now. For crying out loud, it's like a 278 percent increase in murders in the last couple of months in New York and right. you know, Bill de Blasio doesn't seem to know how to put that genie back in the, you know, back in the bottle. Well, I, so, I think, I think Joel, it's, um, I could say, I, I got the, for work, I got to go to Jerusalem and spend some time in Israel and uh, almost everybody there is armed. And to get into some buildings, you have medical detect, metal uh, detectors, you have armed guards, you have people there. I mean, that's some works. safety. <laughs> No, it's interesting. Uh, Chris, was that you asking that? Yeah. Saying that? Yeah. So that you're, you're right. And what's interesting is um, Israel doesn't have a constitutional right to bear arms, interestingly enough, 
right? Hmm. Um, but al almost everybody serves in the military. So everybody, almost everybody knows how to use a weapon. And of course, there's a lot of people that, you know, are still, you know, are, are permitted to do it. When I first came to Israel, my first time was to go to undergraduate, uh, just a semester abroad at Tel Aviv University. It was back in 1987. And one of the things they taught me, I mean, just, you know, just as a junior in college, uh, I was going to Syracuse University, but was over here in Tel Aviv. Long story short, they said, don't leave a bag or like a bag of groceries or something, just a backpack. Don't, don't leave it lying around because people get worried that there's a bomb in it and they'll call the police. And when you come back for it, when you realize you left it someplace, they'll come around the corner and the bomb squad will be there blowing it up. Boom. So, mm -hmm. and I said, really, did they do that? I said, I said let, let me give you an example though, that don't be worried, they said. So he said, there, uh, a couple, a few years ago, a few terrorists from Jordan snuck in. They were going to kill a bunch of Israelis and then sneak back into Jordan. But they saw, as they were getting ready to do their attack, they saw a sporting goods shop. And they thought, oh, dude, let's, you know, let's get some, let's rob it and get some sporting goods, you know, I don't know, whatever, soccer stuff or whatever. And then once we kill a bunch of Jews, then we'll go back and we'll have this stuff. Well, what they didn't count on was that Israelis just walking by noticed that they were holding up the store. And so they stopped everybody on the street, all the traffic came to a halt. And like a scene out of Bonnie and Clyde, everybody pulled out their weapons. <laughs> and when these two guys came running out the door, boom, gone. Bad day. <laughs> so we don't have a lot of street crime here. <laughs> yeah. I'm not saying there isn't political violence that comes in waves, but you do not see muggings and rapes and just general murders and, and, and kidnappings stuff the way you do, um, you know. Just about every American city. No, I, I remember going to a McDonald's. Hard to, hard to convince people of that unless they come. And when they come on a tour, like all their families says, don't go to Israel. What are you crazy? That's insane. They get here and they're like, wow, it's amazing how, how relaxed we feel, how hometown it feels and it's true hmm. and, and you know, clean, the fact way. that the Iranians want to nuke us but other than that we yeah, you know. <laughs> we no, Joel I, I found I found the city uh clean welcoming uh Arab and Jew alike and then uh going to like the McDonald's and seeing you know young women with uh you know M4s or whatever weapon they were using rifles <laughs> on their lap as they're eating a you know a burger or whatnot it always blew my mind it is it is much more like Texas than it is like New York, right? If you see someone in New York with a weapon, you should be worried. Right. If but if, you know, if you see someone, you know, in, in Texas, you'd be like, oh, that's probably okay. Yeah. And that is that is true here. Um and you wear, you know, when you wear when you have a weapon, either a, a pistol, more likely a, a, a rifle or an automatic rifle, uh, you just carry it with you because they want to deputize soldiers that are off duty they right. you know they want you to be ready at any moment because it is a small country and we do have uh some bad neighbors not all fortunately but um and you have to be ready at a moment's notice and uh yeah it's it's actually encouraging <laughs> Uh, let's, let's get back to your novels. In your earlier ones, you featured, and you talked about this just before, a New York Times reporter, a Wall Street strategist, a CIA operative. Now it seems you've amped up the character even more, your, your character creation with Riker's background, his capabilities. It more closely resembles, as you were talking uh, earlier, about like Brad Thor, Scott Harvath, or Vince Flynn's Mitch Rapp. Um, was this a conscious decision or just a natural progression due to the knowledge and skill you've, you've collected these past yeah. two decades? Well, I, first of all, I'm enjoying uh, doing this interview with you guys because you are thriller lovers and, you, and you, uh, you've got a wide range of, uh, you know, you're reading a wide range. It's funny how seldom I talk and do interviews with people who are actually talking about book writing. <laughs> <laughs> Often they're talking about, right, the geopolitical situations in the novel. So anyway, right. I just want to, this is a lot of fun and I appreciate uh, <laughs> yeah. what you guys do with the cool reviews and all. But listen, um, I would say, well, well, one thing is, how long can you really get away at this stage with having a New York Times foreign correspondent be your main character? Like, <laughs> if you're <laughs> center right politically, that's going to last about another nine seconds. It's probably already over, right? I mean, it's just, but also, 
I mean, I thought it was interesting because one of the things I liked about doing that series, and again, it's, I've just had the freedom, and maybe I've been wrong commercially, but artistically, oh, that sounds weird. I'm not, art, I'm not an artiste. Anyway, <laughs> if you want to write novels, okay, let's just be honest. Having the freedom to write a three part series, a trilogy on a New York, Times, New York Times foreign correspondent that goes to interview the head of ISIS, mm -hmm. right? I, I, was, I was interested in that because in many ways, foreign correspondents are, are intelligence operatives. They are right. gathering hmm. source material. They're just doing it openly right. rather than clandestinely. And their reports are read by every leader in the world. Yep. If you're working for the New York Times, you're working for the Washington Post, Wall Street Journal, The Economist, BBC, whatever, your material that you gather is not going to be in some dusty, uh, uh, you know, inbox somewhere in the Central Intelligence Agency or MI6. You're on the front page of the world's leading newspapers or television programs, which means many more people have access to the intelligence that you're gathering. That's what I found interesting. And your lifespan, your life expectancy can be higher in theory, right? Because you, because the, because the terrorists need you to live in order to write their take, right? They want to say what they want to say and they want you to write it. And that's a, that's a dangerous game. And obviously a lot of journalists don't make it. Yeah. But they're incredibly brave and they're, they, they're just, risk analysis calculation is just completely flipped on its head from a clandestine officer. So I thought it was very, actually very interesting. And one of the things that was fun about that, uh, I'll just say, is that um, King Abdullah read that series. That's awesome. Wow. That's and awesome. it was a series about ISIS trying to assassinate him and his family. Yeah. And he was a named character and then blow up his palace and take over his kingdom. And it was all based on this New York Times reporter who goes to interview the head of ISIS and gets the interview. Um, now, but you're right, at some point, a Wall Street strategist and a New York Times foreign correspondent do not have the skill sets to sustain, in my view, more than three or four or five books. Like, <laughs> there's only so many times that's plausible. And, you know, I would say that my only main difference, uh, I, so I wanted the skill set, there's no question. Uh, I, I needed those, that set of skill sets, but I... I wanted to create a character actually different from Mitch Rapp or James Bond or, you know, Jack Reacher or anything. Um, certainly, uh, or Scott Harvath. I didn't want him to be an assassin. Not because I'm morally opposed, necessarily, hmm. um, but I didn't want him to be proactive hunting hmm. people. Um, I wanted him to be pulled into this thing ag sort of against his will, that he was sort of has these skill sets, but he doesn't want to use it anymore. He wants to have a more normal life because some things have shattered in his life. And um, he fears that he spent more of his life, his career, protecting his country and its leaders than the people <clears throat> closest to him. So the tragedy pulls him out of the game and then events pull him back in. And, and that's the sort of moral wrestlings and challenges that I wanted to use to set up um, Marcus Riker. And, and of course, I didn't want to create the same characters that my friends and colleagues are writing so brilliantly. So I, I needed a different angle into this. Thing. Right. Well, you've succeeded. It's, it's definitely yeah, feels fresh. Sure. Even, though, even though they tread similar ground, it, it's completely, it feels different. So, mm -hmm. well, let's stick with uh, Marcus Riker. He's kind of taking a tour of the headlines, uh, doing battle with Russia, Iran, North Korea. And in your latest, The Jerusalem Assassin, he's trying to stop an, assassina an assassination plot that would under undermine a new Midi I'd love to be able to speak right now. That would undermine <laughs> a new Mideast peace plan. Can you tell us a little bit more about the novel and kind of what planted that story in your head? Sure. So if you, if you, if we don't get into uh, the first two novels that sort of set it up, uh, the Kremlin conspiracy and the Persian gamble, um, and, and people can read them without having read the, 
the backstory. Um, but so, so let's just talk about it as is. So where are we in my fictional universe? In my fictional universe, Russia is on its heels um, from book one. And Iran and North Korea are back on its heels and not in a, in a very aggressive mode at the moment because of the Persian Gamble. So that has created a fictional environment in which my fictional president decides this would be a good time to roll out my big Middle East peace plan to try to bring about peace between the Israelis and the Palestinians because, because I've sort of created some space geopolitically mm -hmm. uh, in the Middle East that I think this could work. What's not anticipating, and most American presidents don't, is once you get ready to launch a peace process, more often than not, bad guys come out of the woodwork. Yeah. Okay. And if you look at the two, two of the people that made peace in the last, you know, in my lifetime, let's say I'm, I'm 53, I was born in 1967. So one of them was Anwar Sadat, the president of Egypt, right. who was assassinated mm -hmm. by the Muslim Brotherhood just a few years later. So many people see that as a, as a, a cautionary tale, don't go there. If you're an Arab leader, don't go make peace with the Israelis. On the Israeli side, the prime minister that made peace with the King of Jordan was the Israeli prime minister Yitzhak Rabin, who was assassinated, not by a foreigner, not by a Palestinian, not by a radical Islamist, but by a radical Jewish crazy person in Jerusalem. Yeah. So two of the great peacemakers of our time were assassinated. And we have often seen when, you know, either before, during, or after a peace process, again, horrible people come out of the woodwork. It doesn't mean, in my view, that you shouldn't try and do it all the more reason, but you have to be aware that, that you know, that bad guys hate peace and they will <laughs> rob, kill, and destroy to stop it. And so in the Jerusalem assassin, the theory is, that the setup is, well, what if this American president begins to prepare to roll this israeli Palestinian peace plan out and then a series of senior U.S. officials involved in drafting the plan start getting assassinated. And this right. rattles the president, and he's thinking maybe this is the worst time. You know, maybe this is, I, he wasn't anticipating this, although some of his advisors were warning him. But anyway, he, he's about to hold back and not release the plan when he gets a back channel message. And the back channel message is from the Saudi government of all saying, listen, we, we've read your plan, Mr. President. We don't agree with it all. We have some serious disagreements with it, in fact, but there's some parts we like. But listen, we're ready to make peace with Israel. And if you, Mr. President, would invite us to a high-profile peace summit in Jerusalem with the Prime Minister of Israel uh, and you, Mr. President, then either the Crown Prince or the King will come to Jerusalem and have that summit with you. This electrifies the President. And he thinks, this is fantastic. Let's do that. That's historic. And all the security advisors, 100% of them are like, are you mad? Are you, like, <laughs> are you not watching what's going on? The idea of putting the crown prince, the prime minister, and you on the Temple Mount in this environment is bloody crazy. Like, you, yeah. you can't do it. Which, of course, the president, like, he turns to Marcus Riker, a former Secret Service agent, now with the CIA, he says, you, got, you make it work, and it'll work. And so the countdown is on. Air Force One is coming. The Saudis are coming. Israelis are there. And so are the bad guys. And um, that's the setup um, for the Jerusalem assassin. Wow. And if you don't want to buy that book now, I don't know what's wrong <laughs> with you. <laughs> that's a great setup. Uh, well, we just talked about the Jerusalem Assassin, uh, which is the third Marcus Riker book, and you've had two previous trilogies. So are you moving on from Marcus Riker, or is there another story there to be told still? I am not moving on. I have really come to like this character. Um, he's the most interesting character I think that I've created, at least to me. Um, he's, he's, he's a widower. Um, he's lost a child. Uh, he's got a lot of scars and doesn't want to do this. But events have, have conspired, as it were, to pull him uh, back into 
service to his government. And he is in some unique positions uh, to, to do this. So, uh, no, I just have finished uh, this summer uh, the manuscript and the edits on the fourth uh, in the series. And there we go. There we go. Uh, so the next one's going to be called the Beirut Protocol. Oh. I wish it was out right now because suddenly Beirut has yeah. literally exploded into the news. And I don't think anyone's talked about Lebanon in like a oh, long wow. time. Yeah, 30 it's been years. years. But um, Marcus Riker is going to get himself kidnapped and drawn deep into enemy territory. And that's the setup for uh, the, the Beirut. Wow. Wow. So I need we're, to we're talking, get, geez. we're talking Iran and Hezbollah, I guess, huh? <laughs> You're talking Iran and Hezbollah. That's true. Mm, that's yeah, funny. that's awesome. Essentially, uh, Marcus is, you know, they're still working on the, on the Saudi-Israeli peace plan, and he's, uh, he's on an advance trip uh, for the incoming Secretary of State, and they're up on the Israeli-Lebanon border, and a big firefight ensues. And yeah, uh, I can't say more than that, but that's... Right. Uh, that's where we. That's where we're going next. Uh, and, and again, part of my goal is to create situations that are, you know, you know, you look. You, well, this is not, you know, a lot of authors do this. You create your strengths in your characters, and then you attack those strengths, right? Um, and we, I, I've not written in any of these novels about anybody being kidnapped. So, um, it, it, you know, by definition, when you're kidnapped the other side has the initiative and and everything that all your skill sets are now uh either irrelevant or under tremendous pressure and i thought that would be a really interesting place to take uh marcus record hmm. wow. an american in beirut getting kidnapped works for the cia hmm. we've heard that one before too haven't we? yeah it's happened in real life and it did in real life well. yeah. Yeah. yeah uh, uh fred burton Buckley. Yeah, read. Uh, he wrote Beirut Rules. Pretty, uh, pretty. Uh, yeah, there's hard others. I mean, for for many years in the 70s and 80s, there were a lot of Americans that were either kidnapped or killed. The the head of um, the the president of of the American University of Beirut, uh, Malcolm Kerr, whose son Steve Kerr uh, is actually featured in the uh, new Netflix uh, documentary on Michael Jordan, right. The Last Dance. He was one of the key stars but less you know obviously famous than, than scotty pippen or or michael jordan or you know but he but it's his father who was murdered by terrorists um as the president of american university uh, jeremy mm -hmm. levin was uh, a correspondent for uh cnn uh and was uh, uh was kidnapped uh he lived um also escaped uh so anyway these but we haven't heard again. Lebanon hasn't really been in the news until of late. Um, but it's it's a it's a uh, it's a cauldron of boiling yeah. evil. Uh, there's wonderful people there. It used to be the Switzerland of the Middle East. Yeah, it would be called the Paris of the Middle East. It was it was peaceful and it was Muslims and and Christians and others all kind of working together. And then in the 70s, it just blew to pieces. And one uh, one of my brothers-in-law. Uh, is actually born and raised in Beirut. Uh, is an Arab Christian. Uh, grew up in a in a um, an apartment building during the civil war of the 70s. Uh, mm -hmm. Muslims versus Christians, and Muslims versus Muslims, and it was it was brutal. His stories are are just chilling, and uh, we he and I spent a lot of time together when I was mapping out this book. Yeah, I bet. I'd be uh, I'd be curious to read the headlines a year from now. See how close you get. And then speaking to that, um, Sean alluded uh, to this, to the mention of the, like the, the tour through the headlines. Uh, but you're noted even beyond the last jihad for your ability to write stories that seem to predict the future. Um, how do you react when you see yourself referred to as a modern day Nostradamus? <laughs> well, I, I, um, I always discount it. I mean, I'm not, uh, I'm not a psychic. I'm not a clairvoyant. Uh, you guys may be a little young for this, but um, I, I didn't. I don't read Miss Cleo to oh. figure out what I'm going to do with the rest of my. You know, <laughs> we're, my we're, I would have loved to talk to her. <laughs> for, your, for your listeners, your viewers will say, Miss Cleo, she was the psychic uh, who somehow couldn't foresee 
that she was about to be arrested for tax evasion by the IRS. <laughs> <laughs> saying seems like that's one that didn't come through the crystal ball. But anyway, uh, so no, look, I, I am actually not trying to predict, and it, and I and I deal with this often. I, look, I don't mind people saying it because there, it, it, there's, it's an intriguing hook as to why should you read a Joel Rosenberg novel because they cool. seem to predict tomorrow's headlines. But I'm actually not trying to do that. In fact, you know, the, most of the things that happen in my books are so horrible. I definitely don't want these things to happen. Yeah. I'm not predicting they will. But I would say one of the themes of my thrillers is this, to misunderstand the nature and threat of evil is to risk being blindsided by it. Mm. And, and, my, and my premise is that in 1941, uh, the, you know, the American government didn't understand the threat of evil posed by Imperial Japan. Part of that was uh, we just didn't believe them of what they wanted to accomplish. But it's also there was a, there was a there was a racist undertone to our inability at the political level or the intelligence or the military level to think that the Imperial Japanese were capable yeah. of coming as far as Pearl Harbor, that they, right. they couldn't do it, they wouldn't do it, and we would never let them do it, but then they did it. We were blindsided because we didn't understand the nature and threat of the evil that was posed by them. And that was the same is true on 9-11, right? We all know now from right. the 9-11 Commission report how much was known about the threat posed by Al-Qaeda. Um, and, and the main takeaway from the entire, you know, whatever it was, 800 page report or whatever, was this, that 9-11 was not so much a failure of intelligence, it was a failure of imagination. And, and you recall um, President Bush, Condoleezza Rice, others at the time saying, you know, no one could have imagined people hijacking the plane and flying it into an American city. Look, I don't fault them at, at a certain level um, I don't think, I mean, I, I, I especially because President Bush is a reader of my novels, but I will <laughs> say, uh, um, but actually, if I'm able to come up with it, uh, somebody at the CIA, somebody, uh, you know, at the Pentagon ought to be able to think this was possible. And when you look back at how much evidence the CIA had over here and the FBI had over yeah. here, but then you had that artificial wall that they couldn't talk to each other right. it was a problem because it was knowable it was you could figure it you could have figured it out and um and it wasn't unimaginable i understand why people would say it because it blindsided us yeah. and, and my great fear in life is that i know that more evil is coming that I, I i know that from history i know that from my faith i know that from my life but i also know that people turn a blind eye. They mm. turn a deaf yeah. ear. To, when, when somebody threatens you, uh, sometimes people are like, oh, I, you know, they're just, they're just blowing smoke. They're just saber rattling, yeah. right? So one of the ways I write novels is I go find real bad guys in the world and I ask current and former, you know, people in power, say, who do you think are the bad guys of the future that we really ought to look at? Then I go read everything that I can find that they've said or written and then I believe them. Mm -hmm. If somebody says I'm going to wipe Israel off the map, I'm like, let's imagine they really set off to do that. If they say they're going to come attack America, I say, I'm not willing to dismiss them. I say, let's imagine that they could come up with a scenario that could really hit us. What would that look like? And yeah. that's actually how I write these. And I don't know that that's predictive. I think that's, that's more um, the worst case scenario, uh, uh, war gaming, imagining what if, and that's a, that's a scary place to live. That's where I live in my head. Yeah. Earlier you mentioned that you were a film student and you also mentioned uh, the genesis behind your first book. But when you graduated from, a, from Syracuse with a BFA in film, uh, was that your intended career path and what steered you off that path? Well, uh, when I started at Syracuse, that was my intended path, which was, <laughs> uh, you know, probably narrative filmmaking. 
Um, as I was going through it, I was, uh, you know, again, I was in Israel, as I mentioned, in 1987. When I got here, life was quiet. By the time I left, the, the first intifada, or Palestinian uprising, had broken out while I was here. And that, got, and that became a dominant story in the American media. And it got me interested in this other side of me, which was journalism, documentary filmmaking, political analysis. I, I had always been torn between the story, uh, uh, the narrative story of drama and, 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 and news mm. and, uh, and analysis. So I couldn't decide whether I want to be a, a, a network field producer or a documentary filmmaker or, you know, make movies. And, and I sort of had both things cooking. Um, and then I fell in love uh, mm. and wanted to get married. And mm -hmm. I was like, I don't think moving out to Hollywood is going to be the thing that <laughs> Sean. I can't be a starving artist. And <laughs> you're going to make some money. Not me, and neither <laughs> would her father. So, right. so uh, basically I thought, well, Somebody mentioned you should move to Washington, Joel, when, you know, to find a job and get ready to get married because the entire city is run by 20 year olds. I mean, you're either 60 and 70 and you're, you know, the head of the Senate Intelligence Committee or you're 25. Like, there's not a lot of middle ground. Go get a job there. And I did. And boom, I got a job very quickly. So I was a little bit torn. Um, and, and I think the rest of my life has shown how torn I am. I'm writing novels about newspaper reporters or <laughs> political thrillers about people who get pulled into Washington when they really want to go do something else. I, you know, so you're seeing a few of those themes uh, running through my work. Well, you well how did your, a, go ahead, Sean. I'm sorry. How did your film background and um, experience inform your novel writing? Well, one thing is my wife is the English major, creative writing major, Jewish studies minor. Like she actually understands literature. That's her academic training. I understand movies. Like, you know, I would tell my roommate in college, listen, you know, I know you're studying calculus, but I got to study this opening scene of Raiders of the Lost Ark. Keep it down. Right? Like, um, so I, I, okay, all right, I'm going to admit this to you guys. Um, you seem like friendly people. And I'm a long way away from you. So uh, <laughs> I actually don't really like fiction that much. Wow. No kidding. I, 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 have, I have sort of begun to read more fiction in recent years thinking, you know, this is sort of my career. I ought to know what the other guys are doing that do it really well, better mm -hmm. than me, sell more books than me. And I'm interested in them. And I, and I have worked hard in the last four or five years to sort of get up to speed. But I was not a reader of, of, uh, of fiction. Uh, you know, I, my sister-in-law would buy me a Clancy or a Grisham every year for Christmas. And if I could get through it, I would get through it and I would enjoy it. But then I would get back to Washington political life. Now, I say that because I think that having not read a lot of political thrillers in my life, I know that, uh, okay, I'm just saying it, <laughs> to be honest. Um, I think of, from the perspective of a film, uh, I'll, I'll, I'm much more likely to think in terms of um, Jack Reacher the movie than Jack Reacher the books, though I have now read, you know, uh, eight or nine of them and, and I love them. Um, I am more likely to, uh, you know, think about Mission Impossible um, than, you know, some of the other uh, political thrillers out there. So I think it, I think I write very visually. Mm -hmm. I think the first scene, for example, in Last Jihad, when, you know, I think that's the first line of the Last Jihad, the first line I ever wrote for a novel was, um, uh, a presidential motorcade is a fascinating sight, especially at night and especially from the air. And as that first scene unfolds, it's a Gulfstream 4 business jet coming in on a kamikaze attack mission to attack a presidential motorcade that is just, you know, the Air Force One has just landed and it's just getting underway in, um, it, you know, in Denver. Hmm. And I think of that not as a novel. I think of that as the opening scene of a movie I'd like to see made one day. Right. Hasn't been. So I, I guess that's probably the influence of, of the film is that's what, that's the world I lived in. Um, not, um, not Pride and Prejudice and uh, <laughs> and the Odyssey and whatever, but uh, Shakespeare. 
<laughs> we, you know, for me, I, about- if I could have choose, chosen between literature and uh, and movies, I would obviously choose movies every day. And I would look <laughs> at the literature going, you know, Matt and uh, Matt and uh, very <laughs> scary. <laughs> 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 Very scary. Yeah. Another skill that Joel oh, has, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> now, are you doing David Spade doing Bush, or are you just doing <laughs> <laughs> uh, not doing Spade, but um, Dana Carvey? Uh, Dana Carvey. Car- yeah, Dana Carvey. Yeah, yeah, so, Dana Carvey. So, so sorry, Dana Carvey so beautifully. He was like he he. I, I don't really know how to do impressions, but uh, uh, but he unpacked it when he was at the White House. That was the old days when you could make fun of a president and still be friendly, yeah. right? And he said. Uh, the key to George H. W. Bush was, on the one hand, it's John Wayne, and a little Mister Rogers, <laughs> and you combine them, and it's not gonna do it. Wouldn't be good at this juncture. There's good. Here's I, love that. I love that clip of him at the White House yeah. when he's uh, talking at the podium, and, oh, and George W. is in. I mean, George Seniors in the. Audience. <laughs> and, and that was the world that doesn't exist anymore, right? right. You could right. genuinely right. make fun of the president and be super funny, but there was, you know, you were still being, you weren't trying to be mean. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's a different that's world a, now. That's a long, long time. Overall, you look at all, you, you've also written a lot of nonfiction as well. And we didn't touch on that. But overall, you've had a great deal of success both in fiction and nonfiction. Of all the books that you've written since you started this part of your your life, which one do you think you you have the most? Uh, which one are they most proud of, and not necessarily from a from a success you know financial success, but which one are you the most proud of having written? Well, that's a good question. I used to say something ridiculous like, "Oh, they're all my children," and I you know, <laughs> keep them all to say, "Okay, they're not my children." Um, <laughs> Um, I would probably say uh, the one um, detour that I took, um, I wrote a, a historical novel, a work of uh, historical fiction called The Auschwitz Escape, hmm. uh, about four men escaping um, from the Auschwitz-Birkenau uh, uh, death camp in 1944. It was inspired by the true story of four men that did escape. But there's a lot about their stories that, as much as I researched it, that a lot that we don't know. And I didn't want to put words in their mouths or actions to them that we don't really know. So I, there are still four characters who escape, but then there's this other set of two, and I sort of focus on these other two. And that was that was a that was a very scary book to write. Uh, even as a Jew, I avoided going to Auschwitz for. Most of my life, I finally decided to go. Um, it was it was uh, horrible, but it was the right thing to do. And then you know the fear. You know this is this is like sacred ground. Like you know I I, I didn't want to win some award by Mahmoud Ahmadinejad in Iran as writing fiction about the Holocaust. Right? The whole there's a right. whole camp of people who thinks the Holocaust is yeah. fiction. How could you possibly write a novel right. about it? That was scary. So I spent a lot of time with Holocaust uh, experts here in Israel and in the United States. Anyway, all that to say, the Auschwitz escape, um, it didn't do nearly as well as, as the others, but it was a really interesting story. I went to the town of Le Chambon sur Lignon, a little French town uh, that, um, this little town of 3,000 people, uh, their pastors, the Protestant evangelical pastors in the town, decided we need to save these Jews that are coming off of trains escaping from uh, Germany and, and Eastern and Central Europe. And so the whole town of 3,000 ended up saving more than 5,000 people. Oh. And later, both the state of Israel and the government of France awarded the entire town, including the pastors, uh, with this sort of righteous Gentile status. Um, and I thought, so, so, so one of my characters is a Jewish character who's been part of the resistance, and he gets captured and sent to Auschwitz. And another character is a is a young pastor from this town who gets captured by the Gestapo and sent to Auschwitz, and they meet. And while it's a fictional story, I did enormous amounts of research in both Auschwitz and uh, this French town, and at the main Holocaust Research Center here in Israel hmm. called Yad Shem. 
and uh, and actually uh, interviewed and spent time with some of the scholars that knew the men that actually did escape. And again, they escaped not just to get out for themselves, which of course they were had every right to do. They escaped to warn Churchill and FDR what was actually happening at Auschwitz, because most people didn't know, in order that the camps could be liberated or bombed. Right. And um, that we just recently signed a, um, a development deal uh, for a movie uh, or, or a Netflix or Amazon um, you know, uh, miniseries on it. So we'll see where that goes. It's gone further than the other options that we've done over the years. And I'm finding it interesting because it is, it is sort of my baby. Like that, I mm -hmm. love that novel more than all the others. I think in part because it, it's, it, it's, it's a part of my history and yeah. I want it to go well. So we'll see, we'll see what happens with it. That's fantastic. Yeah, fantastic. we can't wait to see that come to fruition. That'd be awesome. Hey. If it's done right. and, I, and I don't want, you know, what I keep telling the producers, don't think, what I want you to think of it is this is the greatest escape in human history. Make yeah. it like a thriller. Yes, there are elements of, obviously, all, all kinds of elements, including faith elements, um, Jewish and, and Christian. But don't think of it like a faith movie. I, I Think of it like a thriller. Like, how would you get to, how would you survive it, and how would you get out of the worst death camp in, the, in all of human history? That story is so interesting and so compelling. I just hope they do it. I hope they rock it, because it'll be, it'll be a great film. Awesome. Well, hey, you survived the main portion of the crew review show, but there's more. Mm. Oh, oh, I think I think um, I can't really hear you right now. No, I'm just yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we have what's called the lightning round. These will be a uh, series of questions from each of us. There's very little thought put into the questions, and we expect very little thought in the uh, output. I can do that. I can do <laughs> so since I am up as today's uh, host, I'm going to ask you my first three questions. Oh, Question my. number one, what is the New York deli that beats all challengers? I'm sorry, the New York. A, a New York deli. Deli. Oh, my gosh. Well, they closed it. Uh, it was Carnegie Deli back Carnegie. in the day. Oh, Carnegie Deli. Um, oh, yeah. Uh, now I would say it's Katz's Katz. uh, Deli out in um, Brooklyn. Um, I love it. Uh, yeah, how about it? <laughs> love All Katz. right. Question number two. You are now deciding to give up all your current endeavors and you're going to follow your passion as a hip-hop artist. <laughs> what is going to be your rapper name? Well, I think I would just sign on to be the publicist for Kanye West. I don't think I would actually go into the <laughs> career myself, but he's dabbling in some interesting areas. And I say, I just, you know, of course, I would probably ruin his career. Yeah, would, <laughs> I've done for everyone else I work for. But uh, yeah, I think I'd be more of a PR guy for, for Kanye. Okay, so Kanye would be president <laughs> in 10 years. All right, sounds good. Well, whatever he does, I mean, uh, I like Chick-fil-A. <laughs> Okay. Number three, let's hear your best political joke. Oh, well, it uh, probably goes, well, well, okay, it's not going to be my best. I mean, I just did my impression, but uh, uh, all right, here's my, can I do my worst? Do sure, it. absolutely. Okay, so um, I do a Reagan impression. Okay. Well, Mike, I am, uh, it's good to be with you, and I just want to say that uh, people ask me all the time, uh, how I got into acting. And uh, well, I, I remember being in elementary school. Uh, I played a hot dog in an elementary pageant and I've always relished the role. Oh, <laughs> oh. Uh. boom. There you go. You were that's fantastic. That's why I'm not a stand up comedian. You were, you were correct about that. No, that's fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's right on par with, the, with what the crews. Yeah, yeah that's, you're, you're, that's you're, awesome. you fit right in. Now, listen, if we want to go into Bill Clinton, we can certainly go into that territory, but I, I don't you know, know Bill Clinton. Oh, my God. I, I, don't know, I don't know what you come out when you go into Bill Clinton. <laughs> all, right. Uh, all right. You're up. Um, hey, Joel, I know we were being kind of funny, but will Israel and Iran ever find peace? 
Uh, yes, I believe they will. Um, but the regime in Iran has to fall. And I think there is a lot of momentum building. Uh, I don't know that it can happen, uh, you know, naturally. <laughs> You know, sometimes I think it's going to take a supernatural uh, overthrow mm. of this regime. But it's what's what's crazy is that the vast majority of the Iranian people hate their own yeah. government. Yep. And uh, they either love or at least like the American people and government. And they keep waiting. You know, you liberated Iraq. What about us? Yeah. Like, what? And um, also, I will just say uh, quickly, I know it's lightning. Uh, Keep in mind that until 1979, when the Ayatollah Khomeini came to power, Iran was an ally of Israel. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the Shah of Iran was moderate. Sure. He was Muslim, yeah. but he was a moderate. Yeah, now he was also increasing, you know, he was becoming more and more authoritarian. The mm -hmm. secret police were horrible. But if, geopolitically, he was a moderate towards Israel, sold Iranian oil to Israel, <laughs> And um, and Iranian and Israeli air forces trained together. It's a it's a story that people don't know, and it all blew up in 1979. Right. Yeah. 1970s Iran. It's so much different than than current. Yeah. Um, so you uh, you're religious. Um, so my next question is: What is the most treasured religious item you keep in your office or home? Oh. Um, well, yeah. So I'm I'm, a, I'm Jewish who believes in Jesus. So that is an interesting. <laughs> that's got right. people head spinning. And then I love it. I love it. Yeah. Muslim world leaders, and I'm like, hey, wait, sorry, what? <laughs> um, you know, There's more of you than you think, though. <laughs> well, you know, it it says I have seen some head spin in Muslim capitals as they try to get their head around that. Jewish, yeah. you know, here in Israel too. You know, I we are not people that keep many your artifacts or um i think my just my own personal collection of bibles that i that are all you know highly marked up i know some people feel you shouldn't mark up a bible i'm of the view these are not the original text and so <laughs> mark away and um so i think that's my you know but i think maybe more that is is seeing uh the bibles of my my four sons that as they've been growing in their faith you know with with all their own challenges in life as they uh take seriously the very scriptures that were written here yeah. or near here. It's a fascinating place to live. Um, so we have a small apartment. Even if we had artifacts, we wouldn't keep them. We've got the whole country as an artifact. And so uh, that, that's true. I guess the apartment itself has uh, <laughs> put us in the, in the epicenter of the epicenter. Yeah. Keeping with the religious theme, if Jesus were to return tomorrow, which country or city do you think he'd first appear? Oh, there's no question. That's that's scriptural. So he would come to Jerusalem. Yep. He's not coming to New York or Indiana. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, I'm sorry, but it's 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 stated both in Jewish and uh, and the Christian New Testament scriptures. Uh, he's coming here to Jerusalem. So I got a front row seat. Yeah, you do. Yeah. Um, but, or staying uh, at Joel's house. You know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, my my first question is a little biblical too. Um, I have two sons with biblical names, Luke yeah. and Noah, and I know you have four. Yes. But what I'm curious about is, was Zerubbabel or jo Jehoshaphat ever in consideration for your children's names? <laughs> they were not. They were not. Um, I joke uh, with my wife that Zadok was a cool name, um, which means righteous, uh, and he was a high priest. And she's just she and the boys just look at me like horrified thank god we didn't have a fifth child they say you know, <laughs> i might have pushed for it no i don't know but uh, no the, the host of fat was definitely not uh, no not, just spelling it <laughs> okay uh, there's a lot of names there's a lot of biblical names that you would just not want to no. give to your children um <laughs> unless you hated them and, and, I, and I, you know, so and, a, uh, and it, ironically our, our, Ironically, a good number of them are in the uh, lineage of Christ from uh, <laughs> from David down to. Look, you know, these are names dating back three to four thousand years, and some of them are not. You know, they're, they're not exactly uh, the latest names. But it's interesting. Our four sons are Caleb, Jacob, Jonah, and Noah, and those four names are all actually fairly popular and coming back in a certain mm -hmm. way. Jonah and Noah, in particular. Yeah, I don't sure. know why. But um, 
anyway, those are the relatively sane versions. Of, uh, okay. <laughs> question, question number two, um, as a resident, what is the best dining spot in Jerusalem and what is your favorite dish there? Oh, wow. Um, uh, you're saying specifically in Jerusalem or just in Israel generally? Oh, let's well, just say Israel. Go, you can go broader. You can go broader. I'm just looking for red. Hey, look, I'm always looking for food recommendations. But when you guys come over, let's do, let's seriously do a, a special show from Jerusalem uh, or from Israel. Let's That'd do a awesome. series of shows and bring a few authors over. It'd be so interesting uh, because, I mean, thrillers were invented in Israel. Can I just, can we yeah. just be honest? Yeah, uh, true, this, for sure. This, this is thriller central. Um, yeah. And uh, so anyway, three places I would take you. One, I would take you to the King David Hotel, uh, uh, which is this actually a seven-star hotel. And it's uh, not only uh, great food, but it's great history. Uh, mm -hmm. In part, this is where the British mandate uh, uh, leadership uh, was, was housed. And yet a Jewish terrorist uh, group blew it up, um, trying to drive the British out of uh, Palestine back in the day. So it, it, just when you go there, it's so rich in history and almost every world leader has stayed there yeah. when they come for um, you know, weddings and bar mitzvahs. No, usually uh, state funerals. Um, so <laughs> King David. Secondly, I would take you to a, an Asian restaurant up on the Sea of Galilee. The best Thai and Chinese food I've ever had and around the world. And Jews oh, wow. love Asian. We love Chinese food. You know, on, usually on um, Christmas, most Jews are not celebrating Christmas. Uh, I do. But uh, they're eating Chinese food, right? And uh, there's a great place uh, called Pagoda. And you can look out over the Sea of Galilee and you've got the Golan Heights. And I will tell you amazing stories about crazy wars that have happened up there. And the third one I would take you to uh, is, is called Nora, and that's in an Arab-Israeli uh, town called Abu Ghosh, just outside of Jerusalem. And it's a town that decided to go with Israel in 1948 and decided to help Israel. And they, they say, you know, they, they, they made good choices. And they have amazing food, uh, the best Arab food I have ever had. And I've traveled from Morocco to Afghanistan. Uh, admittedly, Afghanistan is not... Arab, so all your listeners uh, don't, I get it, but anyway, <laughs> yeah. uh, I would love to take you to those three, and if you come for more than three days, we'll meet at other places too. All right. Uh, I like that amazing. idea. <laughs> my, my final question, uh, you, we've discussed, you know, a lot of heads of state or former heads of state or high office holders or advisors. Of all of those, who has the best sense of humor? Wow. Well, well, Okay, that, there's a tie. Okay, I'll just well, I'll, I'll do the I'll do the main one, but there's a runner-up. The runner-up is is probably the most controversial leader on the entire face of the earth, and that's the Saudi Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman. Okay, and wow, I've had two meetings with him. I've spent more than four hours with him, and um, you know, very rarely do you write a political thriller that has a, a Saudi Crown Prince in it and you've actually spent time with this person. Yeah. Super controversial, I get it. But his sense of humor, he invited an Israeli, Jewish, evangelical Zionist <laughs> with two sons in the army to be the first ever to come to his palace. That's crazy and hilarious. Uh, and I'll tell you more stories about him uh, on another show. But the guy who's the funniest, I think, is King Abdullah of Jordan. Because I, I told you earlier that I'd written a a trilogy about ISIS trying yeah. to assassinate him right. <laughs> and blow up his palace. So when my wife and I were invited by him, the man didn't even just, just read our books, my books, he invited us for five days to get to know him. What? And the first meeting we had with him was in the palace that I'd blown up. And uh, so we're having lunch, just him, the advisor who had read the novel and insisted that he read it. And my wife and me, no security, no I'm crazy. And he's like, well, Joel, I was thinking where it would be nice to meet you for the first time. And I thought, well, you did blow up my palace. <laughs> you here, give you a little tour. Cause you know, I said, yes, it's a lovely palace. You don't want to see this happen. I'm not <laughs> predicting it. I'm not hoping for it. Then he said, you know, I've noticed Joel that of course you made me a, a named character risky, but 
He says, but my staff and my advisors, uh, these are all, you, you made up their names. But I can tell who's who. So I have bought copies of your novel and I give them to these to my team and I say, this is you. Uh, you don't make it to the terrorist attack. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> what? Um, <laughs> That's awesome. That's an Here, awesome story. Like I, you know, a Muslim monarch, in, uh, he's a direct descendant of Muhammad. And why is he spending time with a Jewish, Israeli, evangelical, American, Zionist? What? Like, the world is upside he's, down. He's funny, but I, I, I really like him. I've got a lot of admiration. And I think it came through. Um, I hope it came through. Yeah, the book. yeah, I'm sure it did. Well, we really want to uh, send a heartfelt thank you to uh, joining us today in the crew reviews. And uh, please uh, go out and check out Joel's books. They're fantastic. We got a few awesome. of those right there. And um, good, sir. Thank you so much. Good health to you and your family and hope to see you soon. Yeah. I appreciate it. Great to meet you guys virtually. I hope to do that on a future tour. We should oh, do an event. Oh, absolutely. Together. Let's make uh, it now happen. Now that I have restaurant choices, I'm, I'm headed over there. <laughs> All right, yeah. Once, once, the, uh, once the country reopens for business, we'd love to have you guys. Thanks, Joel. Wonderful. Go on the other side. Uh, it's an honor to be on the crew reviews. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. The crew would like to thank Mr. Joel C. Rosenberg for coming on the show today. His latest novel, The Jerusalem Assassin, out this past March in 2020. Also, you can find 14 other fictional titles to his name. And what do we say, Chris? Buy him. Yes. And every Monday, we bring on another new best-selling author, gentlemen. The crew reviews. The other portion of the crew. Good show, gentlemen. Always. This is going to be a nightmare. I can already feel it. Because this is going to be a four-hour exit. One. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the Crew Reviews would like to thank Mr. Joel C. Rosenberg for coming on the show today. His latest novel, The Jerusalem Assassin, is out this past March. And, dang, I looked up and, <laughs> damn it. <laughs> that light. <laughs> Jazz hands wouldn't have done it, but that light got, me like, that light got me like a cat. <laughs> got me too. <laughs> I just froze like a deer. I was like, what am I looking at? I've been like a, a laser. Dang it. Chris, you no one like, take Jake for you. Chris is like the show's version of Antifa. The laser pointer. <laughs> I'm blind. blind. I can't blind. See. Can't Some see. people just like to watch the show burn. Yeah, just burn the whole place down. Take whatever. Get ready, game. And also pick up the other 14 novels that he's produced and his. Yeah. Okay. Oh, that was good. Good, too. You can buy all of his books. Every year. Nice Everyone. them all together. I am. All right. Three, two. No. And also pick up his other 14 fictional titles. And what do we say, Chris? Go out and buy them. Mm, we say it differently than that, but okay. I have a mask on. You look better already. Go out and buy them. There you Do go. It. And what? Nice. What? No. Might just end it. Ran out of quarters. Somebody put some money back. <laughs> <laughs>